God, you are good. You are my daddy. You're, You're in charge. charge. Your, Your kingdom, kingdom come. come. I need help. Heal Please. me. Encourage, Encourage me. Lead me. Pardon me. So do they. Those I love. Those, those I, I don't. don't. This hurting world. Thank you. Welcome to your best 10 minutes, a series of messages on prayer for people who struggle to pray. We've condensed the prayers of the Bible down to a simple, portable, memorable prayer, just four phrases. And I'm urging you to spend a few minutes working your way through this prayer, unpacking each of those sentences. And I think it'll become your best 10 minutes every day. The prayer is simple. God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thank you. We begin by declaring the goodness of God, that he's our father, he's our daddy, that his kingdom is coming, that he's in charge. And then we acknowledge that we just need help. And even the word help reminds us what we need. Lord, heal me, encourage me, lead me, pardon me. That's where we are today. What does it mean to invite the heavenly father to bring pardon or forgiveness into our hearts. Sometimes I think that we deal with unnecessary guilt. We live with guilt that we don't have to live with. That guilt comes and we assume that it has to be a part of our lives when God's plan from the very beginning has been to create a guilt-free people. Would you like to discover a life with no guilt? I was thinking not long ago as I drove past a tattoo parlor. <laughs> Has anybody ever thought about placing a sign up in a tattoo parlor that says, think before you ink? <laughs> I think that'd be a good sign in a tattoo parlor, right? Because once it's there, it's there. And once it's in, it's in. Well, now they do have these folks who come in and they can take the tattoo out, but it costs a lot of money and I understand it hurts. So I've seen some folks that they're probably reconsidering. There's an NBA player who has a P stenciled on his cheek. Says he's a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, so P. Problem is, whoever put it on there, put it on there backwards. So it only works when he looks in the mirror. There's an NFL football player who has God's gift. God's gift. Not only does he lack humility, he needed an apostrophe. He forgot to put the apostrophe over here on God's. He needed a proofreader. <laughs> you know, it's something to have permanent ink mistakes lodged in your skin. But I got to tell you, it's much worse to have mistakes from your past lodged in your heart. The word for that in the Bible and the word for that in life is guilt. Guilt. We have so many reasons to feel guilty in life. All the should'ves, all the could'ves, all the poor decisions, all the misappropriated money, all the times we didn't do what we knew we could have done, even just opportunities we missed. I'm just curious if, if your guilt manifested itself in ink on your skin, if the, what you're feeling guilty about, your regrets, your remorse, were to somehow appear on your skin in the form of a tattoo, I wonder what you would see. Would you see the face of someone whose heart you broke, whose innocence you took? Would you see the amount of money that you squandered? Would you see just some judgmental fa phrases? Poor parent. Terrible student. All of us, to one degree or another, deal with guilt. But guilt manifests itself in our lives in different fashions. Perhaps you've noticed some people, because of guilt, are very defensive. Other people, because of guilt, are very defeated. It's really two ends of the spectrum, both caused by the same malady. Some people, because of guilt, and they cope with their guilt by becoming defensive, aloof, distant, 
uh, sometimes even defiant. Their goal in life is to keep the past in the past, keep that skeleton in that closet, never talk about it, never deal with it. That's done, buried, never going to face it. The consequence is a person who becomes walled off, distant from others. Conversations are always surface. Chit-chat is always on this level, but they're afraid to go deep. They tend to succeed in certain parts of life because that success is somewhat of an anecdote to this guilt that they feel deep within. There's a heavy prone to busyness because the more they are busy, the less they have to think. Some people deal with their past by building a wall and avoiding it. Other people, the defeated person, deals with their past by still living in their past. They become defined by their past. They didn't go through a divorce, they're the divorcee. They didn't lose their self-control, they are the adulterer. They are marked by their past. They didn't screw up, they are a screw up. They didn't fail, they are a flop. And they come to see themselves through their failures. And rather than let their failures refine them, their failures define them. And they feel that God has probably moved on to somebody far more worthy than they. I talked to somebody just this morning who said for years she didn't feel even worthy to go to a church because of her mistakes. Interesting. Church attracts people who are seeking a solution for their guilt. Tragically, many churches don't know how to help people deal with their guilt. And the church becomes a place where that guilt is amplified and the job of the preacher, priest, rabbi becomes to remind everybody of their guilt. Or to tell people how to deal with their guilt themselves without a savior. That's called legalism. Consequently, churches become either places of arrogance or inferiority. You can see it's just a wild cycle, this thing of guilt. And so I'm wondering, am I speaking to anybody who's dealing with guilt? Or even refusing to deal with guilt? Is guilt having its way with you? Could you envision yourself as a guilt-free person? I've got a promise from Scripture I think you'll appreciate. It's out of the Old Testament. God says, no matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out. <laughs> Spiritual tattoo removal. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can extract it, not cover it up. I can take it out, and I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. So God specializes in guilt removal. He can do what no one else can do. He can remove your guilt. We need to point out that guilt in limited doses is good for us. It's God's tool to wake us up to our mistakes. In limited doses, guilt causes us to repent, to return to God, to acknowledge our mistakes, and to seek God out. When God brings the right dosage of guilt, we leave better people. Scripture says we leave more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. God's good guilt causes us to run toward God in appropriate dosages, Guilt is a blessing. But in inappropriate dosages, guilt can be a burden. That's why God monitors the dosage. You were not made to live beneath the weight of guilt. You cannot carry your guilt. You cannot. And for some of you, guilt is taking its toll. But God can carry this guilt. 
And he shows us how. In fact, one of the most interesting passages in the Old Testament shows us how serious God is about helping us deal with our guilt. If you like to fill in the blanks, here's your cue. God's provision for guilt. God's provision for guilt. We go back in the Old Testament to the book of Leviticus. 3,000 years ago, on the Day of Atonement, when the priest would engage the people in this interesting spiritual exercise of guilt removal. The Day of Atonement was the once a year celebration in which all of the children of Israel would come to the tabernacle and they would witness the high priest physically, symbolically deal with their sins. There were several things that happened that day, two of which involved goats. One was a sin sacrifice, and the other was a sin bearer. So the first goat was sacrificed, and his blood was poured out on the altar. The second goat was a sin bearer, and this is the goat I want to talk to you about. The scripture says, Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins. Can you imagine this sight? Thousands of people gathered in front of the tabernacle. There stands Aaron dressed in his priestly garb. He's already sacrificed a bull. He's already sacrificed a goat. And now a live goat is brought to him. I came this close to bringing a goat up here on the stage, but I was afraid, I was afraid I'd lose you and never get you back. And I was also afraid what that goat might do up here. But he would take the goat and look at this. He would confess over that goat all the sins of all the people. What healthy community this brings. A place where people can bring their sins. We are not told how the people announced their sins to Aaron. Maybe they submitted a list before the service began. Maybe he just said, all right, shout them out. I'm an adulterer. I cheated on my taxes. I I, I yelled at my neighbor. I've been critical of my wife. But all of the sins would be confessed. They would be confessed. And Aaron the priest would take the sins as if they were, I don't know, handfuls of mud. Can we say that? Or maybe a black cloud. He He would take the sin and he would place it on the goat. And then the scripture says, once he did this, He shall lay the sins on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land. And he shall release the goat into the wilderness. So a suitable man, I guess that's somebody who knows how to handle goats, would take the goat the sin-bearing goat, the sin-covered goat, he would take the goat and he would walk it toward the wilderness. And I'm just seeing the people watch the goat, watch the man as they get farther and farther, smaller and smaller, and they disappear over the horizon. And the people wait, the people wait. And then the man, after a few moments, begins coming back, 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 and they see He no longer has the goat with him. What's the message? The message is your sins have been taken where they cannot be seen. Your sins have been taken where they cannot be seen. They have been placed upon the back of the goat and the goat took them away. This was a teaching lesson. This was a lab exercise. God was using this to teach the children of Israel and he uses it to teach us today. We cannot carry our own guilt. We cannot. Someone who is guiltless has to carry the mistakes of the guilty. You can bet your sweet Torah that some little 10-year-old kid tugged on his daddy's robe and said, Daddy, why, why, why take the goat away? The goat didn't do anything wrong. And the daddy, ever one to seize a teachable moment, would lower himself eye level with his son and say, that's the point, my son. 
This is how God deals with our sin. He places it upon an innocent being and he takes it away. Several hundred years later, Isaiah the prophet would say, the Lord put on him the punishment for the evil we have done. The Lord put on him. Isaiah didn't know the identity of him. But this prophecy was about Jesus Christ. We know the Lord put on Jesus Christ. He is our sin bearer. The Lord placed upon him the punishment for the evil that we have done. The scripture says he came to put away, to put away sin, to put it away by the sacrifice of himself. He was offered to offered once to bear the sins of many. So who is our sin bearer? We don't use a goat. That was to teach us what was coming. That was to prepare us for what Jesus would do. But Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Let me tell you something. If you have given your heart to Jesus, He has taken your guilt away. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. If you have given your heart to Jesus, he has taken your guilt away. It was last seen on the back of the goat as he headed out into the Death Valley. It's gone. It was placed upon Jesus Christ. And when he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was the sin bearer in the wilderness, in the isolation. And he took your sins away and took your guilt as well. God has done his part. Have you done yours? Can I encourage you just to give God your guilt? Church, I love you. I do. And I talk to you folks every week. Some of you in person, sometimes on the phone, sometimes through emails, oftentimes in gatherings like this. And it's just on my heart that many of you carry unnecessary guilt. You don't have to. You're letting guilt define you. You're letting guilt restrict you. You're pulled down. You're weighed down. It's like a chain. But Jesus came to set the captive free. And he will set you free. And here's how you begin. Would you open yourself up to the idea of a guilt-free you? Just imagine, whoa, you mean I could be guilt-free? Maybe that thought has never occurred to you. Guilt has been so much a part of your life, you just thought it's like your hair or your skin. It's just part of you. No, it's not. No, it's not. Some of you grew up in homes that trafficked in guilt. I've got one friend that says he thought his mom owned a travel agency that specialized in guilt trips. <laughs> Because she's sending him on a new one every day. <laughs> Maybe you can relate. Maybe you grew up in a church that used guilt to motivate people. Maybe you stayed away from church because you thought that's a place that traffics in guilt. Well, listen, God's church is a place of grace. A place that doesn't deny the wrong that we have done, mind you. We are sinners. We acknowledge that. We're not covering it up. We are rebels to the core. We need somebody to forgive us and to carry our guilt. Open yourself up to the possibility of a guilt-free you. Now, I find that some people find this is very difficult. You say, well, what gives me the authority to forgive myself? Or what gives me the cheek to go into the presence of Jesus and say, forgive me, Max, do you know what I have done? Let me tell you what gives you the authority to do this. The Word of Jesus Christ does. Jesus said the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He's the final judge. You're not even the judge of you. You, in coming to Christ, submit yourself to a higher authority, even higher than your own conscience, and certainly higher than your mom or your dad or whoever labeled you as the one who made all those mistakes. So open yourself up to the possibility of a guilt-free you. Here's what you need. You need a day of atonement. You need to place 
your guilt on the back of your sin bearer. Just tell Jesus what you did. Lord, I need help. Heal me, encourage me, lead me. Boy, today, Lord, would you just pardon me? And would you take that sin and would you lift it up and would you place it on the back of your sin bearer? Let Jesus go deep. Let him go deep. Talk to him about that mistake. Talk to him about that decision. Talk to him about the abortion. Talk to him about the abuse. Talk to him about the years that you wandered away from him. Go into as much detail as possible. Confession is not punishment. Confession leads to healing. Confession is not punishment. Confession brings the wound to the surface so it can be treated and healed by the name of Jesus Christ. As long as the sin is a secret, that is a stronghold of the devil. That's, a, that's an inroad, a territory that he can use. G the devil cannot take your salvation, but boy, he can sure take your joy. And so what he does is as long as he's got this secret hidden sin somewhere in your past, he just keeps poking you there like it's a bruise or, or like it's a wound. And he just keeps using that to take your joy away from you. In confession, you bring that to the surface and you tell Jesus what you did and you announce, Lord Jesus, would you please forgive me? I encourage you to be concrete in your confession. Our tendency is to say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a louse. Well, you're not a louse. You're God's child. You're his son, you're his daughter. So be specific. Say, Lord, forgive me. You remember that time in high school, that night, after the football game, and he remembers it. And he'll go with you to that moment. And as you confess it, he will declare grace over that moment. And that moment will no longer have a hold on you. And as he brings different moments of your past to the surface, as you remember them, rather than suppress them or deny them or justify them, rather than get defeated or distant, just say, Lord, forgive me. Would you speak grace over this, please? Would you, in the name of Jesus Christ, would you just please speak grace over this moment? Bring it to the surface. And let him deal with it. I got to tell you, you're going to be a much better mom once you do this. You're going to be a much better dad. You're going to be a lot easier to live with. You're going to like who you are. And listen, you're going to learn to love God like you've never loved him before. Because he's going to bring grace upon grace upon grace. <laughs> All you need is a day of atonement. But you just need it every day. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins. Because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs that we have done. So give God your guilt. As you confess your sin and ask Jesus to take it away, I want to encourage you to do something else. Ask Jesus to replace your guilt with a blessing. He came to give life and to give it abundantly. Jesus, would you take this guilt away? Now would you please replace it with something from you? With joy, with peace, with patience, with a deeper understanding, with the ability to forgive someone else. By the way, sometimes confession to Christ will lead us then to confess to someone else, to apologize, to repair a relationship. And if Christ leads you in this direction, you follow him in this direction. But lay hold to promises like this. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he understands how weak we are, and he remembers we are only dust. As you confess your sin, you give it to him. You say, Lord, pardon me. And you know in your heart, you trust him. He can take it away. He will take it away. He has authority to bring forgiveness into your life. So you receive that forgiveness. You stand up from that prayer and you know, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I'm a forgiven person. Now, the devil's waiting on you just when you walk out the door. 
and he's used to putting guilt drops on you. So now, the next time he brings guilt into your life, here's what you do. You say, no. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, I defy that lie. Because in the name of Jesus, I have been forgiven. By the authority of Jesus, I have been forgiven. And you can speak to the devil. Speak to that spirit. Speak to that wrong thought. Just tell it to get lost. Jesus said, if you have the grain of a mustard seed, you can speak to a mountain and it will move. And some of you have been living surrounded by mountains of guilt. It's time to speak to them. No more. No more. I'm a forgiven person. I'm declared free. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you know what? You're going to discover some happiness. You're going to discover your sleep better. I've spoken with people who've discovered physical release because that guilt had them so constricted in their body, they begin to feel themselves opening up physically because of the spiritual happening and reality that has taken place. Frederick the Great was, when he was the king of Prussia, once, in visit, once visited a prison in Berlin. Maybe you've heard this story. It's a great story. As he went from prisoner to prisoner, he heard one prisoner after another declare their innocence. Each prisoner was inappropriately judged, falsely accused, wrongly convicted. Only one prisoner was silent, and the king turned to him and said, what about you, sir? And the prisoner said, oh, I deserve to be here. I robbed a man. And the king turned to the superintendent of the prison, and he said, get this guilty man out here before he contaminates all these innocent prisoners. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting how those who suppress their guilt remain in prison? while those who confess it go free. Heavenly Father, we just want to be people who don't play games with you, Lord. We have made mistakes. And we're sorry. Would you please bring a fresh wave of grace into our lives? Would you teach us to trust your forgiveness? We thank you, Jesus, for the work that you can do deep within us. Set people free, even today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.